Good afternoon, everyone. Woo! And also, good morning to the West Coast. It's still morning. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone for coming. My name is Carla Reyes, and I... <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have the fortune of managing the Claudia and Karina 2024 Vote Socialist Campaign. <laughs> this campaign officially launched September 7th, 2023, and we kicked off with our website, our video, our merchandise store. And for us at Socialist, choosing to run was not something we take lightly or just do in a routine way. We make decisions based on investigating our material conditions. We saw groups like Moms for Liberty pop up and take off. We saw the bastardizing of American history, a history that has to reckon with the legacy of slavery, with the genocide of Native people. We saw teachers being targeted for what they were teaching, book bans taking place across libraries and schools, divisions of to an abortion, the right to receive health care based on who and the right to a job, decent housing, whether your student loans are forgiven or not, which some of us have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans. And the two parties offer us nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's decades of broken promises, decades of selling us out like bargaining chips. Ask anyone involved in the rights movement, from the dreamers, to those on the border right now waiting to be processed in the desert, who sold this out? The Democrats. And who is right now promising to deport millions of people, calling immigrants a poison in this country? Trump. Scum. And so when you're between bad and worse, what options are left for us? We have to build the option. It's a socialist option. And that's what this campaign is about. It's about inviting every single person here in this room, on the live stream, if you're in a watch party, it's about inviting us to build something with us. Some people just want to be a part of something. Our comrade told me that, and it's stuck with me ever since. But we want people who want to build something with us. We're a multinational group, young, old, everything in between. We're dedicated people who are choosing to spend every single day outside of all the other obligations and demands that are on us. We have to take care of elderly parents. We have to take care of children raising the next generation of freedom fighters. We have to build a fighting organization that puts socialism on the agenda. And we're choosing to do that. No one's making us do that. That's an active choice outside of, our, of all the other obligations, all the other pressures that the capital system puts on us. And so that calls the question, who should have power in this country? Workers make the country run, period. We build the infrastructure. We design the new technology. We pick the food. We cook the food, which is delicious food, by the way. <laughs> we write the books. We teach the youth. That's all of us. That's our class. And I'll tell you, I was a public school teacher. I talk about this all the time. Um, for over a decade, and I was also a union rep. And I've planned proms, graduations, college trips, all while teaching hundreds of students. That wasn't the ruling class, that wasn't the billionaires, that's us, that's people just like me who know how to do a bunch of things. And what do the millionaires and billionaires do? Nothing. Nothing. They hoard the wealth, they scheme to buy people out, they become richer and richer as we get squeezed more and more. So all the skills to run society, they exist in our class. And what, the skills existing, or us knowing that they exist, that's not enough. We have to get organized with our skills to make our side, the side of the people, the working class, the oppressed, stronger. We need to get organized to take the power and put it in the hands of the working class. So it is our duty to win against the capitalist class. So yes, be a part of this campaign to make socialism visible across all 50 states. But beyond the 50 states, we have to show the world that the people of the United States stand against the US empire, 
stand against imperialism, that we too are internationalists at heart, and that we fly the banners of solidarity, peace, and cooperation. So we join everyone to build a socialist movement in this country because we have to show the billionaires that their time is up. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Again, if you're in the room, via live stream, or in a watch party across the dozens of cities across the United States. And I want to shout out all the volunteer coordinators who have been putting in a lot of work. Yes, please. <laughs> There are, again, dozens of people around the country working to uh, get organized and get volunteers plugged in, and they've also organized these watch parties. And that's what we want people to do. Nothing replaces the in-person connections that happen where you get to talk politics, find other like-minded people, and honestly, scheme for our side, the freedom side, the working side. Get to so we really invite people to be a part of that process. And before we begin our program, I just want to shout out my favorite DJs. I say it over and over. Uptown Vinyl Supreme. <laughs> they're, they're with us today. Shout out to Uptown. Um, and we also, just to speak a little bit about the program for today, uh, we have a combination of videos and in-person speakers who are going to speak about Claudia and Karina, um, not only their support that they have for them and for the campaign, but also some people are going to speak to their personal uh, political journeys and what they've known through working with them over the decades. So thank you again uh, for being with us. And with that, I would like to introduce our first uh, video of the day, which is Lucy Ceballos Felix who is a community leader and organizer in Texas, who's worked, yeah, shout out to Texas, <laughs> who's worked extensively with Karina Garcia. So, Lucy's queued up. Hola, mi nombre es Lucy Ceballos Felix. Soy líder activista en el estado de Texas. Luchamos por los derechos reproductivos desde el 2007. Puedo decir que este año realmente comenzamos una revolución de mujeres que decidimos apostar por nuestra valentía. Descubrimos el gran poder que existe en nosotras mismas. En esta ocasión, es para mí un gran honor compartir con cada uno de ustedes la gran labor que ha desempeñado mi compañera de lucha, Karina García, aquí en Texas. Su sabiduría y experiencia ha ayudado a nuestro movimiento a que siga desarrollándose y creciendo. Para Karina... No existe el desánimo cuando se trata de construir el poder de nuestras comunidades. Gracias a ella, descubrimos que el poder no se encuentra en un sistema político, sino en nuestro pueblo, en nuestra gente. Recuerdo un día en que tuvimos que llevar a cabo unos entrenamientos, unos talleres de liderazgo en el Valle de Río Grande. Fue tan poderoso e impactante esa ocasión que otras personas del valle nos escucharon y quisieron que lleváramos a cabo ese entrenamiento a sus comunidades con la finalidad de unirse a nuestro movimiento. Ahí comprendimos que la educación es poder y ese poder utilizarlo para lograr los cambios que tanto necesitamos en nuestro estado, en nuestro Texas. Este, estos talleres tuvieron más frutos, porque no solamente las personas que tomaron dichos talleres se unieron al movimiento, sino sus familias y amistades. Desde el año 2012, Karina García ha sido parte de nuestro movimiento. Hoy en día hemos visto que los niños que acompañaban a su mamá desde ese tiempo ahora son jóvenes y adultos también, y son parte de nuestra lucha actualmente. Yo pienso que para lograr mantener un movimiento fuerte y poderoso, se requiere de personas con un gran corazón de lucha y pasión por su pueblo. Ese es el caso de mi compañera y amiga y hermana de lucha, Karina García. We can't have any programming today without a full-on uh, speaking to the rights of immigrant women. 
Um, and also having that speaker, Lucy, go in Spanish, I think is critically important given um, the candidates and what their work has been. So thank you, Lucy, for sending that. Um, so next up, I would like to invite uh, Mia Tada up to speak a bit about her experience working with Claudia de la Cruz, our presidential candidate. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk about Claudia, but there's endless things that I could say about Karina Garcia, but they made it easier for me. I'm just supposed to talk about Claudia. Um, but it's, it's, I worked with Claudia at the People's Forum, a space that she founded, and I, there's, there's no words to describe what it's like to work with Claudia de la Cruz. Um, an organizer from the South Bronx since she was 14 years old, someone who has built so many organizations, built so many movements, worked with all kinds of people here in the New York and New Jersey area, and has brought all of that experience of really putting words to action, being on the ground and talking to New York's working class community for her entire life, and she put all of that experience into building the People's Forum. If you don't know what the People's Forum is, you should look it up, but also, um, it is formerly a political and popular education space. I think on the website it says it's an incubator for working class movements. But if you have been there in the last three months, you will see that TPF has grown to be much, much more than that. Um, it is a place where in the same day, you can attend a protest to call for a free Palestine. You can come back to see organizers from New York City doing an art build, building puppets, building posters. And you can come back to see and even speak to key political leaders from the global south. It is a place where on any day in the heart of the heart of the empire, you can attend a class on on the Korean Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, understanding the Palestinian liberation struggle. And this is in no small part to the work of Claudia. And I think for everybody who's, who's joining the campaign now, you'll know that Claudia is a great speaker, a great leader, a powerful presence um, in our movement. But for those who might not know, or you might be surprised to know that Claudia I think, at least, shines the most brightest, the strongest, when she is teaching. Um, Claudia is a serious intellectual and a great pedagogical thinker. And I've had the honor to both be taught by Claudia and to watch her teach. And Claudia has taught me the most important thing, I think, any organizer, any person who stands for people power, for popular movements, can learn. And she represents this every day and everywhere she goes. And you can see it when you meet her. You can see it on video. You can see it on TikTok. Um, she has just a deep and sincere love and humility for our people. The people who come to the People's Forum are working class organizers, artists, students of all kind, nurses, you know, MTA workers, trade union leaders. All of these people come and Claudia just treats them with the most respect and humility to say that she knows that the working class is coming to her to learn about high level political ideas and she just knows how to convey those ideas. She knows how to talk to people. She knows how to teach people to grow in the most loving and stern and important ways that, that we need to develop um, our communities and our leaders. And I guess to, to end, Claudia has been just a, such an important person in my life personally because, you know, as much as she helps me personally, I consider her a very dear friend. Um, she is somebody who, you know, when I was growing to be the political person I am now, I looked to Claudia as a powerful woman leader who showed me what I could do and who I could embrace as a woman in the struggle. 
And when I saw those things in Claudia, I knew that I could do it, and I knew that I could be a leader, and it was my responsibility to be the leader because she had instilled in me that love for my people, that responsibility and that duty for my people. And so I think that the people of this country have no greater honor than to vote for Claudia De La Cruz and see her as our leader. I wish everyone could see what I see right now, but the warm embrace between Claudia and Mia is really, really heartwarming. Um, and I just want to echo that point about Claudia shining when she teaches. That's, she's an amazing, amazing teacher, and I've learned so much. Um, but before I introduce the next uh, speaker, which is a video um, from Stephanie Weatherby, who works with the International People's Assembly, before I get into that, I have to... I meant to do this earlier. I'm a Jersey girl. Anyone who's been around me knows I'm a Jersey girl. And we are in Newark, New Jersey. Now, it's not Newark. It's Newark. And you got to know where you are. Um, I want to speak a little bit to why we're in Newark. Newark has a very powerful history in the black power movement, in the black liberation movement the home of uh, black freedom writer, Amiri Baraka. Um, so I just need to call that as a place, one of the cities that had riots during, the, well, they call them riots, really they're righteous rebellions of oppressed people, um, happened here in Newark um, during the 1960s. So it wasn't um, by chance or a fluke we deliberately chose Newark, New Jersey as the place to have this event because of the history of uh, this city, Brick City. Um, <laughs> so with that, I want to introduce um, the next video, which is Stephanie Weatherby, all the way from Brazil, to discuss political education and the international work that Claudia has done. Hi, I am Stephanie Weatherby and I'm part of the International People's Assembly. When I met Claudia, she was deeply involved with a lot of the struggles that were happening in the streets against police violence. Claudia was out in Ferguson together with thousands and thousands of people who were sick and tired of the kind of violence that was happening in the streets. And it was partly out of those experiences that when we met, we talked a lot about how the kind of energy that people were bringing out into the streets was something that had to be turned into organization, into real power, and about the way in which popular education was a way to do that, was a way to talk to people about how power worked, why the state had the monopoly of violence, and why it was that we needed to build organization to confront it. And from that experience, Claudia and I did a lot of work together, precisely with people that were confronting that kind of violence. I remember a lot of events that Claudia and I participated in together and courses that we ran in North Carolina, for example. And people, when they come into these spaces, even though they're eager to learn, they also bring a lot of anger into the space because they've been facing tremendous amount of violence and they're coming in with a feeling of rage but also a sense of powerlessness. And I was always very impressed with the way that Claudia would always meet people and their emotions, their very raw emotions in that moment and was not daunted or scared by them because I think that sometimes when people are feeling such a strong level of emotion about the injustice that is happening they tend to bring that sometimes into confrontation with one another and even with us as educators and it was always very impressive to me how Claudia would deal with that with a tremendous amount of compassion and care and understanding and with a certain sense of Yes, I am with you in this rage that you're feeling in this moment. I understand how you feel because I feel it as well. And I'm here to say to you that we have to build change together and that we have to overcome together, that we're going to have to do difficult things together, but that you're not alone in doing that. And I think that that kind of an educator is very, very rare to find because Claudia is someone who is not just an educator. She's a leader, but she's there with the people as, as, as one of us not as someone that is coming from a different place to give us the answers. And I think that her ability to really touch on people's humanity and recognize what they were feeling in the moment and trying to build their confidence and reassure them of what they were feeling at that moment was something that was 
priceless for people at that time, that gave them a kind of confidence in what we were doing, confidence in the historic role that we're playing when we're going out and protesting in the streets. And I truly believe that that's the kind of leadership that we need. I think we need leadership that is leading together with us from a place of understanding, from a place of compassion, from a place of shared humanity. Um, that's a part that I think Claudia always like doesn't always play up. As, see, there she is. You're covering her face. But the international work that Claudia has done cannot go overstated, understated. I sometimes misuse this word, but it's an, an essential part of the work that she's she's done, and really a major contribution to us in the movement here in the United States. Um, so up next, I would like to invite Juana Lopez a reproductive justice activist who will speak to her support of Karina Garcia. So come on up, Juana. Wow. So my name is Juana Lopez, she, her. I'm from Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, pre-gentrification. And now I live in New Jersey. Um, it's so, <laughs> listen. I'm timed here, so. Um, it's so wonderful to be in this space with all of you. I feel so honored to be here. Uh, when Kari reached out to me to speak today, um, I was honest with her, and I was like, sis, I don't know. Um, I got in my head about what do I say. Uh, I'm not always the best with putting words together. And as Kari does, she sent me a voicemail that reminded me of who the fuck I was. <laughs> I've known Kari for seven and a half years. We worked together at the Latina Institute and hearing her words of encouragement or rather empowerment, I immediately knew I would speak and what I would say. So if it wasn't for Kari, I wouldn't be here speaking to you. And if it wasn't for Kari, I wouldn't know what it is to speak up at all. Kari taught me the real meaning of what it means to be an organizer. In her work at the Latina Institute, I have seen Cari empower communities and have witnessed our tias, abuelas, primas, and hermanas get that light bulb and say to themselves, wait, I have power? Oh, I can do this, I can advocate for myself? I have a right to advocate for myself? Oh shit, I think I could do that and I will. And in that, I was empowered to lift my voice, not just for me, but for my community. Gadi taught me what it, is, what it means to not just walk the talk, but to live it. That it's not only about being in these streets, but why are you in these streets? What are you fighting for? And how are you living your life aligned to that? That was a lot of words for saying I have a hard time putting words together. <laughs> I just know that when I saw that Kari and Claudia were running for vice president, for president and vice president of these United States, I was like, fuck yes, this is it. We are gonna be out here, the real outside. Gadi is the real deal, the true meaning of being for the people, and not just to get some of us, but all of us free. Thank you. Thank you. That was, we need a, a tissue box spread out here. I got emotional because of all that Kari has meant for me. And I was like, Carla, compose yourself before you get back on stage. Um, so thank you for that, Juana. That was so moving. Um, next up, I would like to invite Amari Butler. Uh, right here. Yeah. <laughs> A pro-Palestine student organizer who will speak to why she supports uh, this campaign. So come on up, Amari. Hi all, my name is Amari Butler. I'm a student organizer with the Harvard African and African American Resistance Organization, affectionately known as AFRO. 
And AFR was founded just recently, at the beginning of last semester in fall of 2023, as a pan-African political body for black students at the university to fight back for our needs against the university. Just as all black people do in America, black students at Harvard are subject to racism in many forms, like at the hands of our private police department, or in the form of a lack of mental health resources and black professionals, and just recently with the overturn of affirmative action just last year. But Afro knows and understands well that the struggle for black liberation is inextricably linked to the Palestinian struggle. And this is why Afro has, over the last four months, made the Palestine struggle a central focus of our organizing on campus, rallying and marching and chanting for a free Palestine week after week. But in response to our steadfast organizing, me and my peers have been subject to a gross suppression campaign at the hands of both the university and its Zionist sponsors. For example, our faces have been on doxing trucks that have circled around campus, our information posted online, we've been harassed and received threats. But none of that has deterred us from our organizing and our, our belief that Palestine will be free. In our organizing and in all the repression, we've seen the university our university actively working against us. Instead of protecting their students, which they claim to be of the utmost most importance to them, they've actively invested resources in keeping us down and keeping us silent. They say they're for the students, but their actions show the opposite. And what I've realized that is that this is similar to how the US government functions at large. The American elite choose to prioritize profit over people. Biden readily sends our tax money to fund war and genocide instead of basic human needs. The ruling class and elite institutions of this country, including Harvard, claim that they value life and liberty and free speech, but we've seen clear as day that this is a big lie. For students and young people like myself, this reality can often make us feel like there's no hope for our future. But there is. And that's why I'm so excited about Claudia and Karina's presidential campaign and the mass people's movement that it calls for. <laughs> because even as a student at the quote unquote best university in the country, there's no place I've learned more from than being in the struggle and in the street. <laughs> and what I've learned is this system doesn't serve us, the people that make it run. It serves the corporate elite, it serves imperialism, it serves war and occupation. But I've also learned that we, the people, have the power to change that. But we have to fight for it. More and, young, more, and more young people and students are understanding this too. Thousands of students at schools all across the country have walked out, boycotted and rallied on their campuses for a free Palestine in the last few months. The struggle for Palestine especially has made young people realize the true nature of the system we live under and where it. Claudia and Karina understand the importance of this struggle too, which is why they've dedicated their entire lives since they were students just like me and my peers to fighting for a better world. And that's why Claudia and Karina's campaign speaks to us. Because we see them in the streets week after week just like us because they come from working class backgrounds just like us, because their political program aims to restructure our society to serve regular people just like us. Points like creating an eco a new economy for the people and building a democracy that serves the working class gives us hope that a new society for the people, a socialist society, is possible. It gives us hope that one day this system will actually serve us and we'll be able to live long, healthy, fulfilling lives. There may not be hope in this system, but there's hope in this campaign. There's hope in the people and the movement, which means there's hope for a better future.
I'm going to say, all these powerful speakers who are before, like, oh, I don't know, are just dropping gems and knowledge, and this is why you guys are our leaders. Um, love it. Um, but thank you, Amari. That was really powerful. Yes, another round of applause. So up next, um, I, this person, in addition to Claudia and Karina, who have also been clear inspirations for me, um, Natalie Harizi, uh, who is the Vice President of Substitutes at United Educators of San Francisco, um, has sent a, a video from San Francisco supporting um, the campaign and speaking to its connections to uh, the future of the labor movement. So I want to uh, bring that up. My name is Natalie Hreezy, and I have been a public school educator in San Francisco for over 15 years. I currently serve as the Vice President of Substitutes with United Educators of San Francisco, the local educators union representing over 6,000 educators in the city of San Francisco. I am so excited to be supporting and being part of the Vote Socialist 2024 campaign, and particularly that here in California in the March 5th primary, I'm going to be able to vote for Claudia and Karina to be the candidates of the Peace and Freedom Party in the state of California, where this real alternative campaign will be available to the millions of working people who live in California. As a local labor leader, I think it's so important that Claudia and Karina represent an alternative to the Democrats and the Republicans, who give lip service and take performative action, saying they support the rights of workers to organize, particularly the Democrats. But then when it comes down to it, when it comes down to actual material support, they do almost nothing or they act against the interests of working people who are organizing in this country, just as Biden did when he intervened against the railroad workers in their struggle for basic rights, for sick pay and leave. That's not what we need in the United States. What we need in the United States are leaders of the country who don't just speak about the rights of workers, but have shown through their actions, through their mobilization, through the work they do, that they're not going to renege on any promises they make. The program that Karina and Claudia have put forward, titled End Capitalism Before It Ends Us, has real hope for working people, real hope for our rights to organize, for the idea that being in a union could be a constitutional right. But as a public school educator, I want to add that after decades of the so-called reform that has really meant underfunding, underutilizing teacher pathways, attacks on teachers' unions, and attempts at privatization, after decades of that, we know we need real solutions. We don't just need lib service. We need a program of action. And the program that Claudia and Karina present is just that. We should have a right to a quality public education from infancy through university and beyond. I am going to go vote for Claudia and Karina on March 5th, and I'm hoping to vote for them again in November in California, and I'm so excited to join the thousands of volunteers who are stepping up to build a real campaign as an alternative to the Democrats and Republicans, but beyond no November, a movement, a movement for working people and for public education, for all the things that we desperately need as times get harder and harder. Um, just to speak a little bit about what Natalie was referring to. So we are seeking the Peace and Freedom Party nomination, and the primaries for that are in uh, March, March 5th in California. And so uh, if you are in California, get your friends, get your neighbors, get your coworkers to change their party registration to Peace and Freedom. The deadline for that is February 20th. Um, and so that's what uh, Natalie was referring to, uh, specifically in California, which means we will be on the ballot without having to uh, fight for ballot access in that state. Um, I also wanted to highlight uh, something else. And really, um, it, I've been thinking about the history of Newark and, and the black liberation struggle. Um, I was brought to Malcolm X's words that American democracy is hypocrisy. And, you know, they say, right, the media, in school, voting is democratic. But if you've been convicted, you can't vote. If you're undocumented, you can't vote. If you're under 18, you can't vote. 
If you're in a state that restricted voting rights for some reason, and it happens to be in the South, and you happen to be a black person, you're probably disenfranchised, and you can't vote. And to get on the ballot, it takes millions of dollars. I was watching other candidates' videos. Maybe I do this. I don't know. I do. I just, com I just admit it. I do this. Um, maybe this is what I do late night to scroll other candidates' videos. Um, and, you know, some candidates were asking for a million dollars. One was asking for 15 million for ballot access in some states. And so everything is stacked against independent candidates getting on the ballot. It takes hundreds of thousands of signatures. I was trying to do the math, and potentially it could be a couple million signatures to gain ballot access as an independent candidate. Republicans, Democrats, they don't have to do that. Frankly, let me talk to you a little bit about campaign finance, because I'm about to, <laughs> no, because it's, it's a lot. The candidate can spend as much money as they want on a campaign. So it makes a lot of sense why millionaires are the ones constantly running for office. They just spend their own money. They don't have to worry about anything. And here we have two working class women, mothers, and we have to figure out how we're going to find and finance everything. And it's really been powered by donations of working class people, forklift operators, nurses, bus drivers. If I tell you the, what comes in on the back end of people just donating what they can, $3, $10, uh, $7, whatever it is, setting up some monthly donations, it's made all the difference for us as we continue planning out the rest of the campaign. And I know there's a lot of talk about ballot access, and it is quite important because it's the main way to gain visibility, but also it's not the only way. And that's why we are really looking for like people to be on the ground too, because like I started off with Malcolm X's words, American democracy is hypocrisy. And for us, Democracy is about collective problem solving and really uh, doing action to solve the problems of society. And right now the ruling class acts like, you give us a vote and we'll figure out the problems for you. Well, you don't know what you're doing at all, clearly. But we know what we're doing because we have the skills. And so we need to um, organize for that. Um, sorry, I just, I didn't, yeah, that was fully off. I was just, it makes me mad, this money question, it really does. <laughs> It makes me so mad um, because we don't have super cap packs where millionaires just like toss a bunch of money and be like, yeah, just like, you know, do my bidding, be my little minion. Like we're not doing that at all. Um, and so I want to talk about contributions um, to the campaign. Um, you can contribute on the Vote Socialist website. We also have set up a, a text service. If you text the word socialist to 8018 zero one, so 801 socialist, be careful how you spell that. Uh, I was like, man, people are gonna really misspell socialist, I hope not, but um, be careful how you spell socialist and, and donate what you can, um, again, and if you can't, spread the word because that matters so much more. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our next speaker who is Dr. Jared Ball. Yes, deserves that. Um, professor and host at Black Power Media, and also the author of the book, Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power. So thank you, Jared, for coming here. Thank you. Peace, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's a real privilege, and I want to thank uh, the organizers, the PSL, and of course, Claudia and Karina for their incredible work and leadership and putting this together and inviting me to contribute in some small way. It's an honor. Uh, I also want to echo, and I already saluted her, but a shout out to the DJ. I, and I hope, I mean, she was killing me. It's, it's brilliant. Uh, so it's an honor to be here, and I love this effort because it's an aggressive and consciously radical approach to electoral politics. Uh, it's certainly not lesser of evil. It's certainly not I'm not going to and I'm going to withdraw. It's an aggressive attempt to use electoral politics to bring people into radical political organization and movement. So it's, <laughs> as we say, bars. It's just, it's just, it's just <laughs> bars. Uh, and we need this. We need this. Because what I've noticed in, in my humble attempt to contribute to a variety of radical efforts over the years is that there's a lot of tough talk publicly and then people quietly go back and vote blue. 
And then they whisper at conferences and at gatherings, sometimes not like this one exactly, but like this one. Oh, you know, I, but I mean, I kind of just had to just, you know. But here we are not only providing an analysis and a political organizational structure, but an actual effort that people can get behind and say, well, if you're going to vote, or if you're not going to vote here, change that up and vote this way. And we have something that is, there, there, we have now something on the docket, so to speak, that we can point to and get in behind and support. As Glenn Ford, the late great co-founder of Black Agenda Report used to say, the Democratic Party is where movements go to die. Yeah. I just heard uh, yesterday or the other day on a great discussion on uh, millennials are killing capitalism between Jared Ware and Dylan Rodriguez, where Jared said brilliantly that the Democrats are the counterinsurgency effort electorally, politically speaking. And we have to represent and become a more aggressive insurgent effort. So just a couple things left here. Uh, there are, there's a number of efforts I've been uh, recently being introduced to that we'll hear more about, I'm sure, in the coming weeks and months to move beyond the Democrats. And I support and agree with all of them. All of them are worthy at minimum of consideration. But what I like about this one is, again, the soundness of its structure and its logic. It's political clarity and a place where radical politics, quite unlike what Glenn Ford said about the Dems, but here radical politics and movements can go to live and indeed thrive. This political campaign represents what we have to, what it represents what it is a representation of what we have as our actual power to combat the billions being sprinkled around to politicians and pundits to scare them into lesser of evil narratives. We can point to this because this represents the real power that we have in people, in social movements, in political organization. We're never going to catch up to the accumulated resources that they have stolen from us. That's the whole point of the theft. So this is what we have and this is what we need to build and support. So just finally, you know, Russell Maroon Schultz, one of the many political prisoners we've been losing lately over the last year or so, last weeks and months, he used to talk about something. He said that the opposite of violence is not nonviolence. That's simply the absence of violence. And I love that logic. Well, here, this campaign represents the true electoral opposition to what exists as a genocidal and violent electoral political structure and apparatus that is imposed on us. This campaign is an electoral oppositional force quite akin to what uh, 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 Russell Maroon Schultz was saying of violence versus nonviolence. And then very lastly, I want to thank you and thank all of the organizers and people here for inviting me and for more importantly putting this work together. For my comrades at Black Power Media, for my Mix What I Like, for my homegirl Renee, who I understand is out here somewhere with Saturdays with Renee. We are here and in solidarity and ready as was referenced as Malcolm X said to swing at least for starters so free Palestine free all political prisoners free the land and as Fred Hampton used to say to you we say peace only if you're willing to fight for it so peace everybody thank you thank you and again catch uh Jared or Dr. Jared Ball. I, I keep on emphasizing that um, on Black Power Media on YouTube um, just to get regular uh, analysis, um, which is really, really insightful. So next up, I would like to invite um, an organizer for Mamas for Palestine, Nizri Muntasar. Oh my gosh. Muntasar. Muntasar. Okay. I apologize. Nizri Muntasar. Uh, come on up. <laughs> Revolution starts as an internal flame kindled by courageous desires. Stepping beyond comfort zones, the magic of change unfolds with one fearless voice and step defying the odds. This is where groundbreaking transformation begins and we all have the power to redefine possibilities. My name is Nisreen and I'm the founder of Mamas for a Free Palestine. Thank you. It's a privilege to stand here before an assembly of seasoned activists during this official campaign kickoff. I'm here today with my family as we come together to commemorate two incredibly empowering advocates for justice, Claudia and Karina. 
Notably, they are not only fighters for justice, but also mothers. Their commitment to social justice deserves commendation, earning them acknowledgement and our collective appreciation. Despite feeling acquainted with Karina through her online speeches, this will be our first face-to-face -face meeting. My initial interaction with Claudia occurred at Folly Square. I was introduced to the hashtag Sharitan for Palestine Coalition on December 3rd, despite my lack of affiliation with any organization. During the same week, Gabby extended an invitation for me to deliver a public speech at the upcoming protest on December 8th. That day, I was only familiar with a handful of organizers. As I stood among the other speakers, a woman unknown to me made her way to the microphone. And my immediate reaction was, wow, that's some great hair. <laughs> However, it was her speech that captivated the audience's attention. Her words were powerful and honest. She had an unapologetic stance for democracy and an unyielding commitment to justice. Her badass energy left me genuinely impressed so much that we marched over to the heart of corruption, Wall Street. I introduced myself and complimented her. And now I find myself standing here in this pivotal moment. When presented with the opportunity to speak, my natural reaction was, what unique perspective can I contribute to this conversation? So I decided to speak about what I know best, being a mother. Claudia and Karina's role as mothers mean their commitment to this campaign goes beyond politics. They understand mothers are driven not only by our personal well-being, but by the fierce love and responsibility we feel for our children. It's a force that propels us to fight tirelessly for a just and equitable world. Regardless of our diverse backgrounds and life experiences, all mothers share a common aspiration for our children. Success, security, good health, and happiness. Picture a typical New York City day. One mother is in a safe neighborhood from Brooklyn, one from the Upper East Side in a penthouse, and another one from the Bronx in a debilitated NYCHA building. Mothers from different walks of life, yet united by the common thread of nurturing aspirations for their children. We encourage them to excel in school, obey the law, be a good citizen, trust in the goodness of people, and you will achieve success and prosperity. We tell them to believe in the promise of a dream where equal rights, freedom, and democracy prevail, a dream where social injustice is achievable. Yet the bitter truth is that today, a promise of an American dream, the land of opportunities, is nothing but a facade. We must acknowledge that today we find ourselves struggling with the harsh reality that where these ideals seem like a distant echo. It's time to recognize that the promise of success for all has become a hollow slogan. And the true pursuit of justice requires us to confront this uncomfortable truth. Despite Ernst's efforts, attaining a commendable level of success remains elusive for some. This seemingly contrary reality prompts us to question the logic of the widely held belief that diligent work inevitably yields prosperity. But how does so much inequality exist in our country and other nations? The answer lies within a flawed system known as capitalism. Where in an affluent amass wealth at an accelerating pace and unscrupulous practices enable some to manipulate the system, leaving the majority struggling to navigate challenge and uncertainties, grappling to maintain their socioeconomic standing. The inherent deception within the American dream ostensibly neglects to eludicate that one's future and success can, all, can be disproportionately influenced by factors such as your race and geographic, geographical location thereby rendering individuals susceptible to becoming victims of an unjust societal system. Irrespective of the political affiliation, be it a Democrat or Republican president, it is regrettably evident that the primary concern for the well-being of the everyday working individual is not prioritized and absent from their agenda. Regrettably, our government has seemingly abandoned its responsibility, leaving us, the citizens, to navigate the challenges of self-sufficiency. A socialist party is beneficial as it reflects a commitment to solemnly prioritize the well-being of the people. For instance, a socialist party may endorse politics that center around affordable health care and education with the aim in enhancing an overall being of the whole population of every community. As we embark on this campaign journey with Claudia and Karina and the entire community, it is time for us to collectively address oppression head on, challenge the false narratives, and share a commitment to dismantling the barriers that stifle progress and equality. 
Together, let us pave the way for a world where the dreams we promise our children are not mere illusions, but tangible realities. And Gaza will free us all. Thank you. Thank you, Nazreen, for making so many powerful, powerful connections and for really coming up as uh, the powerful leader that you are. Um, so next up, I would like to introduce a video by Vijay Prashad, who uh, is with the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and a prolific writer of many books, including Red Star Over the Third World. I clearly listed my favorite book. So <laughs> please um, enjoy. The world is aflame with wars, the climate catastrophe, social inequality, despair. There is the, of course, genocidal war prosecuted by Israel against the Palestinians in Gaza, a terrible war. Now, even the International Court of Justice says that there's plausible evidence there of genocide, a war backed by the United States government, funding Israel, arming Israel, giving Israel diplomatic support, joining the cuts to the UN Palestinian agency, war in Ukraine, where the United States government refusing to allow negotiations towards peace, wars in the eastern flank of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, wars all over the world. The planet is awash with climate catastrophe, with war, with social inequality, with a deep sense of despair. And it's become very, very clear to billions of people around the planet that the United States government, whether governed by Republicans or Democrats, this government is a government of war. It is a government of social inequality. It is a government of climate catastrophe. It is a government that inflames the despair in the hearts of millions and billions of people around the planet. That is the reason why the world needs a change in Washington and precisely why it's important to support the candidacy for the presidency of the United States of Claudia de la Cruz and her running mate, Karina. Karina and Claudia will take the popular movements of the world into Washington, D.C. Their campaign is essential, working to build a significant left force within the United States is absolutely imperative. Elections are an instrument that must be utilized to reach the vast masses of people to have the real debates about despair, about inequality, about the climate catastrophe and about unending wars. Join Claudia, join Karina, join this campaign to make not only the United States, but the world a better place, a safer place, a place where children can smile and not be worried about the sound of drones. That one line really hit. Not worry about the sound of drones. Um, so up next, I have the honor of I know I had to emphasize that because of your sound effects, um, of introducing Eugene Perrier. Yes. If you've ever had a conversation with Eugene, you leave smarter because you learn so much. <laughs> so uh, Eugene is a longtime leader of the PSL and part of the PSL Central Committee and a major supporter of the Claudia and Karina campaign. And he's coming to bring a message to this event from the party leadership. So come on up, Eugene. Well, I really better say something now. <laughs> well, you know, good afternoon, good morning. I think some people are watching here on the West Coast. It really is my honor to have the opportunity to speak here today on behalf of the members of the Party for Socialism and Liberation in literally every single corner of the United States, over 90 different cities, almost every state, every region, any geographical variation you could imagine, many of whom are gathered in watch parties also all around the country today to be a part of this event virtually because they feel the fire within them for this campaign of Claudia and Karina to end capitalism before it ends us. 
you know, it's a heavy message in capitalism before it ends us. And I've been thinking about it for a couple of days, trying to decide what I was going to say here. And, and the thing it kept bringing me back to is this issue you've probably seen with the plane, the Alaska Airlines plane, where the side of it just blew open. Now, you know, thank, thankfully, no one was injured. People lost some things. No one was hurt, thankfully. But very easily, dozens of people could have been dead. I mean, this is, you think about it like, this is like what really scares you when you fly in a plane, <laughs> other than crashing. Like, what if the door just blew open and it sucked me out? And it really happened. And I thought to myself, well, damn, how did this happen? Like, how could this happen? How could the, the thing, the door, just blow open? And I started doing a little research, and I found that, you know, between 1998 and 2019, rather than invest in the things they need to be investing in, Boeing spent about 82% of all of its profits in stock buybacks. Now, what that basically means is that they took 80% of their profits and they gave it back to the rich investors who own the company. And then I found it was actually a little bit worse because in 2019 when they decided to make the plane, they had a choice. They could do a whole new plane, very advanced, you know, where the doors won't just blow off. Or they could just, you know, revamp an old plane and put a little money in and make it kind of nice and all these other pieces. And they didn't want to do a new plane because it would cost them about $7 billion more than the old plane. Between 2013 and 2019, $7 billion is the exact amount of money that they gave back to those wealthy shareholders. And then I thought, okay, well, it can't just be the company. What about the inspectors? Somebody in the FAA, somebody in there had to look at it. And then I learned, much to my surprise, and I got to fly next month, so I'm really surprised, <laughs> the inspectors are employees of the company. The company hires the inspectors, and then, you know, it's a government certification, but the company hires the inspectors. Not to mention, they laid off tens of thousands of workers. So when you wonder, how did the door blow off the plane? It blew off the plane because of capitalist corporate greed. Because they'd rather take their money and buy memberships to country clubs and fly in private jets where the doors definitely won't blow off, as opposed to do anything like paying their workers in a real way. And then they make sure they pay off the politicians to come up with a fake system of oversight that the company itself controls. So I thought about that, and I thought about being sucked out of a plane into the engine and dying. I said, well, you, you're right. We better end capitalism before it ends up. party are, are thinking, and I think as those of you who are out here looking at the election are thinking, you can see that we're up against quite a bit. That it's a very tough battle. And you think, what kind of people do you need to go up against the biggest and the richest and the meanest who will do any kind of dirty trick and spend any amount of money to make sure that their evil deeds can continue? Well, you know, first and foremost, you need somebody who is tough and isn't afraid of a big fight. Well, that's Claudia and Karina. You know that you need somebody who knows how tough it is to make it as a working class person, not because they read about it in the newspaper, but because they know what it's like to have to make it happen even when you don't have it. They know the pain that it feels when there's something you desperately want to do for your family, but you just can't that week. What it means when you might have to skip a meal so someone else in the family can have one. You know you needed somebody who understood what it meant to be a working class person. And that's Claudia and Karina. You know that you need somebody that when they see something wrong, doesn't just go like this. When they see something that just isn't right, doesn't say, well, I hope somebody does something. You know that you need people who look at every injustice 
and say, let's organize the masses of people to turn it into a public display of righteous indignation to say that it has to stop, and that is Claudia and Karina. <laughs> who is watching this online who isn't already supporting. Maybe your friends are showing it to you. Maybe you just came across it and you're angry. You're hurt. You're frustrated. You're anxious. You're depressed. Everywhere you go, something is breaking down and you can't get there. The roads are messed up. The bridges are out. The train is going up in price and going down in service. For people who are out there thinking, I just want to make my favorite meal, and you go into the grocery store, and that one ingredient, you got to leave it behind, and you're saying, ah, I'm just so angry. Mm -hmm. For all of the people who see the genocide happening in Gaza, and you just can't understand how any human being could stand with that, and you're thinking, how, how do we get out? we got to have somebody. There must be somebody out there that can lead us out of this cul-de-sac into a better world no matter what it takes, even if it's a revolution. Well, I'll tell you what, those people exist. That's Claudia and Karina. They want to be on CNN. They want to get, you know, this or that dollar here or there. They want to set themselves up to be a talking head. Two people who didn't put themselves forward but accepted the challenge because they know it isn't about them. It isn't about any of us as individuals. They know that we have to organize us as a collective power to take back what's ours, what we make what we deserve, and what we will have after November 6, 2024. Socialism in the United States. Claudia and Karina are going to lead us there. Thank you. Not Eugene getting everybody super riled up. But, you know, that's, that's why we love him. Um, so, next up... I would like to introduce our vice presidential candidate for the Vote Socialist 2024 campaign, Karina Garcia. We're grateful and we're very humbled 
by your support and all of the support that we've seen so far. And of course, I want to thank you in advance uh, for all of the work that we're about to do as we get really into the petitioning season so that we can get on the ballot in as many states around this country as possible. <laughs> So I want to just share a little bit about why I think the campaign is striking a chord. Um, I think that it's exceeded our expectations <laughs> for sure. Um, and the reason that I think that it's going to continue to keep growing and spreading is because of our message, not because of the individuals. In a presidential campaign, there's always so much that revolves around the individual the personality. And I think that what's made our campaign different and what's made it spread is that we're opposed to all of that. Few things are as unattractive as bourgeois politics. The individualism, the vanity, the celebrity culture, it's the last thing that we want to engage in. And anybody who knows us <laughs> knows this. The false sense of hope that it builds up in individuals who then do nothing but disappoint those same people because they're tied to the same rigged, disgusting system. This feeds a kind of momentary optimism every few years that's only then replaced by an even deeper cynicism. And that's the real threat. Last year, when we were considering whether to do this campaign, I read in a magazine a survey that said that nearly 60% of teen girls in the United States reported feeling persistently sad and hopeless in 2021. Young people are dealing with a sense of depression and hopelessness that's really off the charts. And when you get into the data, it says that progressive young women from low-income families are the saddest, the most depressed, and the most hopeless by far. So of course that resonated with me, and I know that it resonates with Claudia. Young, working-class women, that's us. That's who we've cared for and organized alongside our entire lives. We're talking about people who see the world for what it is. For people who, as individuals, have been taken for granted and overlooked for years. Who, as individuals, start to feel that things can't even change. I felt like that many times, too. But what, what made me feel different, what made me feel powerful and made me feel connected and strong, is that I was part of an organization, that I was part of a movement. And that's what we have to offer in this campaign, the opportunity to contribute to a movement, to build the kind of movement that we know that we deserve, that we know that we can do, and to have a community of dedicated, organized fighters of the working class to make that community happen. So that's what excites me about this campaign. It's the possibility of meeting and growing and working alongside all of those leaders around the country that Claudia have met in all of our different organizing and bringing them together under one party for one program. So we're not, I'm not saying we're not the solution to young women's sadness around capitalism at all. And nor are we trying to be their voices either. No. In fact, what we're trying to do is promote a fighting organization, a fighting program, so that we don't give a false sense of hope. So that we actually help tens of thousands and even maybe millions of working class people feel their power in a collective way, in a way that's tied to an organization. So that's the message that's been resonating. That's what I believe, that the working class makes society run, so the working class should run society. Right? And we know that we do this every day, 
and we do it for poverty wages. And we know that the capitalist owners of the means of production, they reap all the profits from our labor. End capitalism before it ends us. They want us to sleepwalk into a nuclear war. They want to drag us back into the 1800s, but we can't let them. We have to stop them, and we can stop them. Already we've reached huge numbers of people in the campaign, tens of thousands more than we were able to before with a message of building a working class movement. And that's not a gimmick or a catchphrase. That's a bold and honest program about what we need to transform our reality. We know that people are tired of these politicians and their mediocre plans. We are too. We know that there are real solutions to the problems that are facing all of us. And we know that we are proud to be on that ticket with that message, not to inspire people just to vote in this or that election, but to inspire people to become leaders and organizers of their communities so we can take this system down and build a new one. Thank you. Give it up for Karina. So the big question we keep getting is, what states are we going to be on the ballot on in November? And this is far more complicated than you could ever imagine because all 50 states have different ballot access regulations and processes. And some are so undemocratic they are essentially prohibitive of any campaign that doesn't have millions of dollars to employ petitioners to work around the clock in very short periods of time. But I am happy to say that we will be carrying out the biggest petitioning operation of our party's history. <laughs> Give it up. We are confident that we will be, uh, get on more state ballots than any revolutionary socialist campaign in recent history. And if everything goes according to plan, we'll be on enough states to have a path to 270 electoral college votes for the first time in our party's history. <laughs> now, of course, we understand how rigged and undemocratic the system is how they exclude third parties from debates and press coverage while giving free, nonstop coverage of the candidates of the ruling class and the imperialists. And we know that if we got equal, actual equal coverage, tens of millions of people would embrace our campaign and millions would want to get involved with it. And this by itself would change the possibilities radically. But that's not the democracy we live in. We live in a capitalist democracy, which hardly deserves the name democracy at all. But still, based on our assessment of state regulations and the number of energized volunteers we have all around the country, we have set our sights uh, right now on the following states. So, California, Woo! Delaware, Woo! Florida, Woo! Georgia, Idaho, yeah. Iowa, yeah. Kentucky, yeah. Louisiana, yeah. Massachusetts, yeah. Minnesota, yeah. Mississippi, yeah. New Jersey, yeah. New Mexico, yeah. Ohio, yeah. Pennsylvania, yeah. Vermont, Washington, and Wisconsin. Now, that's an impressive list. And there's a few others that we're not announcing just yet, and this list may change based on a variety of factors, since we only 
uh, want to conduct petitioning and use our resources where we are confident we, we can succeed. In those states where the regulations are too prohibitive, we will run rigorous writing campaigns so that every person who wants to support the socialist campaign is able to do so, and all the votes against this capitalist imperialist system are counted. We can definitely announce today that we are going to make this the biggest revolutionary socialist campaign in decades. So, with that, I would like to invite, I need a drum roll right now, our presidential candidate for the Vote Socialist 2024 campaign, Claudia de la Cruz. I had to. I'm going to have to do something that you all are going to have to do with me so that I feel a little bit more comfortable about what just happened. Thank you, Carla. <laughs> Ain't no power like the power of the people because the power of the people don't stop. Say what? Ain't no power like the power of the people because the power of the people don't stop. Say what? You all got the memo. You all got the memo. There is no power like the power of the people because the power of the people does not stop. It has never stopped and it will never stop. And for as long as we live under oppression, there will be resistance. And I just want to call us, and I know my sister who said, lovely hair, I did tell you that you were an organizer for the simple fact of being a mom. There is no more agile organizer than those of us who are caring for life. And so I appreciate your word, sister. And I appreciate Gaza for teaching us resilience and teaching us resistance for over 75 years, because this did not just start October 7th. I want to thank Everyone here, our friends, our families, our comrades, I want to thank all the comrades who have volunteered today and who have taken on the volunteer task, which are many, for the campaign um, for the last three months. Anyone and everyone who's an amplified the message of the campaign, everyone and anyone who has knocked on doors to petition, and more importantly, more importantly, anyone and everyone who has made the decision to join the movement. I want to thank those people mostly. Someone asked me earlier, and I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm going to put the name on blast. My brother from many years, Manolo, said, are, he asked me, are you ready? And I said, I don't know if I've ever been ready, but I'm willing. Many young people that come to movement are always asked whether they are ready to join an organization, whether they are ready to take on the task. And as someone who has taken on a lot of tasks for the last 30 years, I will tell you that you are never fully ready. But you must be willing. You must be willing, you must be dedicated, you must be committed to take on whatever task is necessary to advance the struggles of our people. And we are currently living in a historic moment in time we are often told this election year is the most important election year of your time. I don't know how many times I've been told that. I'm 43. I've heard many times. And the only, the only thing that the Democratic Party gives us is betrayal and disappointment. Because there is not one candidate that actually stands up for what people need. Not only in this country, but also internationally. And so we are not saying that this is the most important electoral year of our lifetime. We're saying that this is a year to make the shift necessary to build the future that we need. You heard that, right? Yeah. This is the year to make the shift necessary to build 
the society and the future that we so urgently need. And what that means is divorcing ourselves from the systems of oppression that have been imposed on us. Imposed on us politically, imposed on us, on us economically and culturally. Which gives us an active task. I never went to a political meeting that I did not get a task. <laughs> and so be ready. Our task is to contribute in building that transformation. It is not to simply give a vote. We're not asking for votes, actually. We want your vote. It's important for the left. It's important for building a political instrument that actually has a force behind it. From the people, by the people, and for the people. But beyond that, what we're asking for is to build an independent movement of the working class. It's to build an independent movement of the working class in which we have full participation and we also have full responsibility. Which means that we're not handing out votes to people who don't earn them. We're not handing out votes to people who have not created projects that are to advance humanity. The project of both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party has been to display aggression, violence, and misery, not only in this country, but throughout the world. And I can't possibly think of a person who has a level, a level of consciousness, just the slightest level of consciousness that would not like to change that. The problem is, and someone mentioned Malcolm X earlier, I think it was my brother, Jared, and I, Carla as well. Malcolm X said, we are not outnumbered, we're out-organized. And the ruling class has consistently utilized all of its structures and systems whether they are economic, whether they are political, whether they are cultural, to keep us unorganized and to keep us divided and to keep us fighting over things that they sit back and laugh about when the Republicans and the Democrats are making their deals. And so we should be able to say this year, we're not going to do that anymore. We must, we must not be complicit of the wars that they launch across the seas, but we must not be complicit of the wars that they unleash on our people every day. And continuing to legitimize their system is being complicit. I remember in 2008, who won 2008's election? Let's see, tell me. Come on, you know who won. A lot of people were happy because they thought that, you know, Having, having someone with our skin color would make the difference. And I want to remember, I want to I wanna remember this piece. A lot of folks, progressive folks, even folks on the left, were excited because he might have constituted a, a significant difference. He was also the person who was responsible for a massive historical, historical deportation campaign. He was also responsible for bombing the living life out of countries in Africa and the Middle East. And so we need to stop thinking about personalities and celebrities and identities. We need to start thinking about political projects. The U.S. empire is not the people's political project. Capitalism, be it in the United States or anywhere in the world, is not a project of the working class. In fact, it works together to keep us down and to identify in our own sector of society, within the working class, let us believe that we are each other's enemy. We must have all the tenderness towards the working class. We must have all the revolutionary patience towards the working class. Because we are working class people. But we, might, we must not reserve any type of anger, frustration, and disgust for the ruling class. 
because they are our enemies. It is Wall Street, it is the bankers, the Federal Reserve, it is the Pentagon, it is every, even, you know, you might think about those progressive politicians, but I'm going to say it again, it's every politician in Congress. Their political project is a ruling class project. And so our campaign is not based on promises. And it's not based on solutions that come out of Karina's head and my head. We have a lot to think about and a lot of ideas, and they're awesome all the time now. But, <laughs> but, the, the, but, but, the, but they, are not, they are not ideas that come from, from us. They come from struggle. They come from a lineage, a historical lineage of people who have understood that the only way to transform is to revolt. That the only way to transform is to build revolution. And this campaign is about uprooting a system that has hurt us enough. And that we are unwilling to allow to continue. And that we are unwilling to allow to legitimize. The Vote Socialist campaign is an intervention in a context in which people are rising up. In which people are coming to the understanding of who their enemy is. And it's a very, very delicate moment in history in which people will say, we want to make a difference. Let's make a difference together. And you will soon hear, you know, the blues out there saying, we need to be, you know, we have progressive measures. We have progressive policies. We just need the people to back them up. Well, we've been backing them up for a long time. Not we, because I vote for people power since I was able to vote. But... We need to convince our people that giving up our livelihood, our livelihood and the livelihood of generations to come to our enemy is the worst strategy we could potentially think of. It is suicide. And we need to stop committing suicide and teaching our children on how to do that. Our aim is to get more than signatures on paper during petition drives. It is more than campaigning and getting on a ballot. It is more than getting the word out. The campaign is an invitation. It's an invitation. And it's not an invitation that is to come and do this work for this year. It is an invitation to do this work for a lifetime. I've been organizing since I was 13. I am 43 proudly. And I don't know what it is to live outside of an organization. I do not know what it is to do anything, really, without it being a collective effort. And it is only in that way that we rehumanize ourselves. And it is only in that way that we learn to be in collectivity and deconstruct the vices that capitalism has imposed on us. There is no other way to do it, but we must be willing. Are you willing? Yes. And I hope that the people on the live, stream are, 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 the live stream are also willing to do so. Because again, we're not seeking merely votes. Votes are necessary. And we hope to encourage people who don't usually vote to vote. We're hoping to encourage the large population, which is not a minor population of people, who have given up. The people who seem and think that there is no way in which they can possibly do anything to change society. Those are the people that we want to reach. The people at the margins of the margins. Those are our people. Those are the people who understand that the Democratic Party and the Republicans don't speak to them because they haven't done shit for them ever. And those are the people that the Republicans attempt to weaponize. Those are the people that they speak to, tapping into everything and any miseducation and misinformation that the education system in this country has taught us. Yes. From bigotry to xenophobia to racism, they tap on all those things, creating an enemy out of people who have more in common with that population 
than the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Yeah. And if we have the love for our people, and if we're able to talk to our people from their material conditions, believe me, you don't believe in socialism. That's right. Yes. People say, why socialism? I learned a long time ago that we can only oppose to things. We are anti-imperialist. Yay! Say yeah with me. Yay! We are anti-capitalist. We are anti-patriarchal. And you keep naming all the things you're anti, and then someone will come and say, but what are you for? We're for socialism. Our proposal is socialism as a way of vindicating humanity. As a way of reclaiming our dignity. As a way of saying that we are not only the producers of everything in human history, we have the full capacity to have the control and have the power over everything and anything we produce. And we need to be able to build the confidence of our working class people to fight for that, to fight to reclaim their dignity, because that is the only purpose we have, to have integrity, to have dignity, to live full lives with dignity, because we are human beings, regardless of whatever the elite want us to think. And this campaign is that type of intervention in this moment. And for me, that is the hopeful part of it. That for a long time, as someone who grew up, was born and raised in the poorest congressional district in New York, which is the South Bronx. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I understood that I had more in common with my people in the Caribbean. That I had more in common with the people in the Global South that I had more in common with the people fighting for independence in Puerto Rico. <laughs> that I had more in common with the Palestinian babies that saw resistance as a path to liberation. <laughs> and when you understand that, and you are committing yourself and your life to transform society in a way that speaks to all human beings that deserve to live full lives, you won't be bought and you won't be bullied because it's principled. It is principled. And if I could have just a few seconds, Carla, because you're looking at me like your time is up. And, um, <laughs> And when you're a party, you need to adhere to party discipline. Let me talk a little bit about the party. I think it's really important and it's really necessary to say that all organizations have a role in society. Be them student organizing collectives, be them artist collectives, be them labor unions, but the role of the party, the role of the party is highly significant. And we live within a capitalist dictatorship that has told us that the only political vehicles are theirs. You could have any other little group you want, but don't you dare build a socialist or communist political party. Don't you dare do that. And I have found myself in relationship with people, amazing comrades, for the last 19 years who have had the crazy idea, but also the courageous idea of building a socialist party in this country. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that is a huge undertaking because the level of adversaries are not minor adversaries. If you study history well enough, I mean, you don't need to go so, back, so far back. Just think about the Black Panther Party, which is like, they're people as old as that, and people who actually experienced being part of the Black Panther Party in this country. You don't get cookies and flowers for organizing a socialist organization. You definitely don't get 
applauses or you don't get spaces. And these comrades, 19 years ago, comrades that come from a legacy of communists, decided that it was necessary. And for the not last 19 years, 20 years this year, yeah, whoa, whoa, come on. I think y'all are expecting or waiting for me to give you the, yeah, go do it. No, do it, do it, do it, amp it up. For the last 20 years, have taken on a task against all odds. When you start a project like this, when you start a political organization like this that has had the capacity to grow, and the majority of my comrades, I'm happy to say, are younger than me. We have a strong leadership of comrades that have been doing this for a long time. I'm like in the miscellaneous spot of the party. But to be able to see young people assume the responsibility and be willing to grow this socialist political party is energizing. It's energizing. And it is something that I hope people that are not connected to the party will at least have a spark of curiosity and say, I want to know what they're about. I'm going to say something really probably outrageous. The internet is not the only source of research. <laughs> Do your job. Get, get out your house. <laughs> Go meet somebody at a branch. Go to the PSL website and say, okay, there's, there's one right across town. And actually make it there and speak to people. And have the willingness to grow within organization. That takes another level of bravery. And that takes another le level, level of political commitment. So I'm going to close and say I am very grateful to be part of a community of comrades that are serious, that are disciplined, and that are teaching me every day not only on how to be a better comrade, but also how to be a better human being. And this campaign journey is one that, and I could, I could almost say I speak for Karina as well, because we've been on this road for a while, about 19 years. Um, <laughs> I could almost say that I speak with, for her when I say, the only way we could have actually taken on the task, as our brother Eugene mentioned, was knowing the caliber of our political party knowing the caliber of our political party. I am humbled by the opportunity to be part of it. I am humbled by the opportunity to contribute to it. But more than anything, I am proud to be from the party of socialism, for socialism and liberation. So thank you to all the comrades that in day, day in and day out do everything they do across this country and meet the, advers the adversaries and meet the challenges and obstacles with the utmost discipline and the most integrity. I am proud to be your comrade. And we are all proud to be your comrade.